Welcome or welcome back to The Trending Communicator. I'm your host, Dan Nessel. So I wonder how many of you out there are struggling with proving your value to your company or to your clients, because I know I do. And I gotta tell you, stress can really get to you. Then there's trouble. There's always trouble. A lawsuit, layoffs, financial shenanigans, a bad tweet, or far worse, tragedies, accidents, even crimes with a human cost. Now, I've been involved in some of these situations and thankfully never dealt with a crime or injuries or death. And here's the thing. When there's trouble, communicators roll up their sleeves and get to work. We turn trouble around and send it away. Nobody questions our value then. I'm talking about crisis communications, of course, and PR pros either love it or hate it. Some have like a preternatural skill at dealing with it. But all of us have to do it at one point or another. And experience goes a long way in a crisis, but with the evolving threats and risks we see around us every day, cyber attacks, misinformation, AI, AI misuse, social upheaval, we can't rely on tried and true crisis plans and methods anymore. We need a lot of help. Well, we're in for a treat today because my guests are two of the most accomplished and effective crisis communicators I've ever met, albeit from two very different worlds. One is an in-demand PR strategist, corporate counsel, crisis management consultant who has helped Fortune 500 clients and the occasional president of the United States through more than a few dust-ups. The other, a former FBI hostage negotiator, spy chaser, criminal investigator, and one-time pastor. Between them, they've taught thousands of students at Princeton, Cornell, West Point, Georgetown, and Columbia, and now they've teamed up as co-founders of The Convincing Company where they bridge the worlds of PR and crisis negotiation for a wide range of clients. Please welcome to the trending communicator, Adele Gambardella and Chip Massey. Adele and Chip, it's great to see you. Great to see you too. Good to be here. You know, I'll be uh, completely transparent for, uh, for our listeners here today. I have, um, I've only done one other show with two guests and um, I have, I'm facing this with a little bit of trepidation uh, and a lot of excitement. Because, uh, well, I had a little chance to catch up with you guys before we started recording, and I have no fear that I can just sit back and let you guys run. Uh, but, you know, it, it, there's, there's a lot of things I want to know about what you're doing. I mean, you've just, you've published a book, uh, and you have, um, you have, you know, been in business together and, and counseling Fortune 500 clients and, and, uh, and personages of all sorts and teaching. And I think you have a lot to offer the PR and comms community especially when it comes to the area of crisis, but a lot more than that, because, you know, the one thing that I learned from doing the little bit of scant research that I do is, um, is that the skills that you teach and that you, that you practice as the convincing company are across the, are like all across all of PR and communications and marketing skills. Like you need what, what you're selling in a sense, in, in a sense, what you guys are experts at convincing is central really to what we all need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, I, I, I do want to get into crisis. I want to talk about the things you're doing. I, you know, I, I do want to cover, uh, let you guys talk about the book a little bit. Um, but first tell me how this, like, how did this happen? You have an FBI, former FBI investigator, you know, crisis ho hostage negotiator and a publicist become crisis counselor extraordinaire. How did you guys get together? How did this happen? Chip, you okay? You, you go first. All right. So um, when I retired from the uh, the FBI in around 2017, and um, I was still figuring out what my next step was going to be, what the business model, because I, I knew I wanted to go into business, and I um, I was talking to various people about it, and you know, uh, some people that. Uh, uh, said, you know, there's a lot of potential here for what you know that would be applicable in the world of business. So started putting together some things and went to an entrepreneur dinner. And at this dinner, small, you know, you know, the kind of things, Dan, where you sitting around, there's about 12 people there. And there's at some point you go around the room and you introduce yourself and what it is you do. So Adele's at this dinner. And after we both had a chance to give our brief on who we are and what we did. Um, as we started talking after the dinner and said, 
Adele's asking me questions. I'm asking her questions. She said, you know, there's a lot here. I think we have a complementary skill set. I think it would be interesting for us to continue on in the conversation. So that happened. And then in August, we're talking about the business and the kind of things that we wanted to focus in on. And in that time, Dan, Adele starts to interview me. Now, you need to know something about Adele, (laughs) is that she was a reporter for a period of time. Uh, you, you already know this, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, but for your audience. And she knows how to dig and she knows how to investigate. And I was kind of, you know, I felt like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> am, I, am I under investigation here? Um, and she was asking me very pointed questions about what I learned at Quantico, what I learned in the field as an FBI agent, and what I learned as a hostage negotiator and all the training that involved and how I used it. How was it applicable? What were the strategies, the tactics that were employed? So after several weeks of this, Adele starts to formulate a plan. (laughs) And this is, a you know, Adele does identify as a PR specialist, as a crisis communication expert, as an author. You know, she's spoken at the UN twice. She has worked for heads of state. But also she is a business strategist. And I've seen this again and again in in working with her that she, when people come up to us and they describe their business and Adele asks them, you know, well, how are things are going so forth? And they, you know, invariably say, well, you know, it's kind of, I'm not doing well in this area. Adele will have a solution for them in under five minutes. I've seen it again. That could be obnoxious. Well, (laughs) it's a help to anybody who's looking for, you know, free advice. So anyway, Adele says, you know what? I think we're good to go here. We have, we have some solid IP. This has definitely a a target audience. Here's what we're going to do, Chip. In three months, we're going to put together a masterclass. We're going to present it in New York City. And that's what happened, Dan. Three months later, wow. we were in New York City in a room full of 250 people. It was sold out. We had to bring in extra chairs because of Adele's business acumen again. And yet it was a huge success. We did it again in Washington, D.C. This was around- Right before COVID. Have you, I don't know if you heard about the <laughs> pandemic, but the <laughs> pandemic hit at just as we completed the second one. And so <laughs> there we are, right? So we're done. I love uh, the inquisitive question by Dan. Like, excuse me, sir, I'm yeah. adding up the years. And, uh, well, I mean, yeah. and, and I take that as a huge compliment, uh, Adele, from, from a PR pro like you and a, and a former reporter that I, I, I do tend to ask a couple questions every now and then. Um, and, you know, being, being uh, uh, in the same biz, although I was never a reporter, um, I have the utmost respect, of course, for people who do, who practice the art or the crime of journalism, depends on who you're talking to. Uh, but you know, I feel like I feel like our life as or our lives as communicators is really about interrogation. Like a lot of it is about interrogation. It is. Um, yeah. And, and we can touch on that a little later when when I, when I inevitably and eventually bring up AI because I am a one trick pony in that respect. But uh, but you know, the way to I think get through any kind of problem, let's call it, or or, you know, to understand a narrative or to f- figure out a story is clearly to ask a whole lot of questions um, in, in the right way. Um, you know, and I guess, you know, Ch- Chip has just has just introduced you and how you how you both met. But let me turn it over to you now and ask you then. So from your perspective, A, is all of that true? And B, <laughs> B uh, you know, what made you think of like, OK, I'm listening to uh, to Chip talk and, you know, Hostage negotiation. All right, that's going to go really well with what I do. Let's make a company. How did that happen? Yeah. So, you know, I had had a PR agency and I had like 20 people working for me. And I've got to tell you that I've got, I got really burned out. (laughs) And right before the pandemic, I, I don't know, serendipitously uh, decided to not renew my very expensive office lease and just go and do the stuff that I was really passionate about, which is like to focus entirely on training and crisis communications. Those were the two areas. 
I have done public relations. I'm really good at it. I love it. However, I just really got burned out from yeah. it. And it, it wasn't my total passion at that point. And when you own a company and you don't want to go to work, I think that's a sign. Yeah. <laughs> so I decided, I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to go do the stuff that I want to focus on. And then I went, actually, it was like one of the first networking events I had gone to after I decided that. And I met Chip and I was like, this is like the next iteration of the business because I just thought as as a corporate communicator, as a, as a crisis person, what Chip knows, and that's why I was interviewing him, yeah. what he knows about people, what he knows about like emotions, how people deal under stress, um, you know, was not something that I knew a lot about. I mean, I had instincts around it, but I didn't never felt like I was really tuned into it. Like, let me give you an example. Yeah. Um, I've handled lots of crises for lots of different clients before meeting Chip. And people would take my advice. They knew it was the right advice, but it was like taking medicine, mm -hmm. right? Like they would take it. They wouldn't like it. They, you know, they would kind of, you know, maybe even fight me on a couple of things. Right? It, was, it was difficult to get them to do what I wanted them to do. They would do it and the result would be good. But at the end, it wasn't as like, you know, it wasn't as easy. And then Chip comes along. I bring him in on a crisis. And one of the, one of the first crises we have is like, uh, um, is for a nonprofit. And this girl gets mugged and people hear about her getting mugged. And it's like really negative And it's getting this like, you know, uptick. And it's a university related thing. And parents are worried. And Chip comes in. He's like, you know, utterly cool. He's like, okay, nobody died. We just got mugged. Like, I mean, like, he, he just made the whole room. <laughs> Like, feel really, like, no stress. Here's what we do. Mm. Listen to everybody. Made them feel heard. You know, we had this one girl who came in super defensive, and Chip was like, just practiced his forensic listening, de-escalated her, made the executives feel really comfortable with the strategy. So while I was implementing and I knew the right steps to take, he was – making people feel better, making people feel comfortable, making them, it, like, cause you cannot, it's really hard to do both. You yeah. know, it's very hard to tell someone, to, someone what to do while comforting them because, you know, sometimes they don't want to do what you're telling mm -hmm. them to do. Right. Like, it's like, well, you've got to apologize. Oh. Well, I don't want to apologize. Well, you need to apologize. <laughs> it's like, like, that's really the only course of action you have. And Chip's like, Talk to me about why you don't want to apologize. <laughs> like, you know, like I didn't have the time yeah. or the inclination to do it like that. And so I think what we can really, what our book is a culmination of is like how to be incredibly convincing, but while taking people's feelings into account, while being a good negotiator, while moving them to where you want them to go in a strategic way. And now when we do crisis communications, People are comfortable. They're happy with us. They are mm -hmm. excited to work with us afterwards. I mean, yeah. not while they're in the crisis. That's still that's still tricky and, you know, can be difficult. And sometimes people don't want to do what we're telling them. But for the most part, they follow our advice. We listen. It's it's a much slower process, actually, but like... Um, but more effective as far as yeah. how people feel emotionally. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you say, Chip? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am... Um... Some of the things you said actually like resonate so well with experiences that I've had in various crises, you know, and, and well, it, it's never been my strongest suit, um, in communication. Well, I'm better now than I was before, you know, experience does that. Um, and different situations kind of give you different perspectives, you know, and sometimes just the sheer, I guess, responsibility or accountability for the result is, you know, changes the way that you look at things, you know, the, the, the higher or the more kind of responsibility I get within organizations. You know, the more keyed in I am to what the outcome needs to be. But I, I hear what you're saying, um, Adele. Like, I think in crisis comms, a lot of us go into it with, with that outcome in mind. Like, okay, look, you need to get to this outcome where, you're, where your reputation is restored or it's back to a certain point, or at least it's going to go in the right trajectory. You know, we've identified all the different reasons why it's possibly happening. And here's... Let's take a look. Let's do some some uh, an audit of where you are with the company and who should be speaking and blah blah. You know, so basically you, you become like a like a field command, uh, you know, like a general or or you know, a um, you know big project manager right on the spot. And 
um, take charge and say, this is what needs to happen, et cetera. And, you know, hats off to legal. Oftentimes you're with the legal people and you're just trying to, you know, you're just figuring it all out, arguing with the legal people most of the time, but generally speaking, you know. Um, Chip, Chip, did you just hear what he said? Yeah. Arguing with the legal. Yeah. I love it. I love it. It's true. It's true right? Yeah. But, yeah. But here's what, what, uh, what stuck out, stuck out to me is this whole idea of time. So, you know, we don't, we don't often take our time with crises, every crisis to the person who, and, and the company or the people that are in the middle of it seems like it's a now, now, now thing. And, you know, the story about Chip, like coming in and talking about the, you know, the student, okay, nobody was killed, you know, it's, it's, everybody's okay. You know, let's, 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 let's be calm. A good friend of mine always says, um, it's, it's PR, not ER, you know, like we have to. We have to think, we have to sometimes remind ourselves of the right mindset, but we lack that kind of long view. And sometimes it doesn't matter really what our clients or our internal clients are thinking. It's just like, let's get to the end of this and fix it. Right. So this brings me to Chip's forensic listening uh, skill, because that you mentioned forensic listening, um, you know, great time to introduce that to our listeners. and. Why, first of all, what is it, Chip? Can you, can you go through what forensic listening is and why we as communicators or even the marketers listening to this, anybody listening to this, really should embed that in their skill set? Sure, yeah. Um, this really has been one of the most, for me personally, uh, exciting portions of the work that Adele and I do. Um, this came as a result of my study. Any hostage negotiator is going to have active listening skill sets. We all know what those are, right? And its purpose is to de-escalate somebody who's in a crisis event. Uh, you're going to take them from a 10 to a 5 to a 2. And the reason why you want to do that is because you want to get them in their best frame of mind so that your words and things that you want to have happen are actually touching down in the other person's world. When we are under crisis, you know this so well, Dan, is that, is that we're in our worst state and we're in that primitive brain. We have our analytical abilities go to almost nothing. And that's true when we're under physical threat as AKA a hostage situation or somebody about to jump off a bridge or a barricaded subject. But it's also true in a business context. And let me explain what I mean. So your boss comes out, the client comes out and they're furious at you. They're yelling, they're threatening to pull out. Uh, they're threatening to fire you, all horrible things. And the brain interprets this as the same way as if you were under physical threat of losing your life. You know this, Dan. Sadly. So it, because the brain can't differentiate between a physical threat and a social threat, it experiences the body in the same way. We take on that stressor. We take on that danger element in our mind and things start to shut down all around us with our, with our primitive brain. Just when we need to be analytical, when we need to be fast on our feet, when we need to have a positive mindset so that we can think our way through the problem, things are shutting down, right? We're, we're losing our hearing is, is diminishing. So is our eyesight, our peripheral vision's going. Our body is going to start to shake because of the influx of adrenaline. We're even under the ability not to no longer have fine motor skills. So texting is going to be diminished. All bad things, right? So when we talk about forensic listening, we're talking about something else. Because not every event is a crisis event. And when we deal mostly in our day-to-day -day work, work world, we're talking to People that are on an even keel that, you know, either there's tension here and there, sure, but it's not to the level of someone's got a gun to your head. So with forensic listening, what we're saying here is it's, it's the art and science 
of analyzing a conversation after it's happened. Because we say words leave clues. And if we take the time and we have a process, and that's what we do, we teach the process, we take our clients through this. What is forensic listening all about? When we take the time and go over an important conversation with a client, with a boss, with a coworker, a team leader, whatever that is in our world, and we go back and we think about that conversation in the context of forensic listening using the four quadrant method of understanding that other person, we are going to become so much better at understanding where they're coming from, who they are, and how they want us to relate to them. So forensic listening, and, and I'll just give you the thumbnail sketch, Dan. Yeah. If the, it's a four-quadrant system. And the, the top left quadrant, let's say, we, you know, one of the things we advise, hey, when you're taking notes, we all need to take notes, you know, to, for next actions, what's important, that kind of thing. We also want you to take notes from forensic listening standpoint, mm-hmm. and it's this. So the top left quadrant is going to be about the emotion. What emotion is the client, boss, whoever, team leader is in front of you conveying? And when does it change? When do you see a dip? When do you see it rise up? When do you see, you know, happiness, joy, excitement, fear, all those things? You want to write that down. Top right is going to be theme development. And what we mean by that is that is that even though the meeting might have been called and it's about, hey, we need to uh, increase our client engagement where, you know, we're not doing so well there. Um, Really what the meeting is about is that the boss keeps returning to a theme of, you guys aren't reporting into me often enough. I'm not aware of what you're doing. I need to be updated. And it's repeated like two or three times. Now, you know, that's important. You're going to write that down. You're also going to link the emotion that she's conveyed with that. Now, moving on. So the bottom left is going to be body positioning. And we differentiate body positioning from body language, Dan. We've all heard, you know, hey, if they're sitting with their arms crossed and their legs folded, they want to disconnect. They want to move away. Maybe they're upset. They don't like something we said. The fact of the matter is some people just like to sit with their arms folded and their legs crossed, right? It doesn't mean anything necessarily. So, but body positioning, what we're saying is that we understand and identify that we are all creatures of movement in our world, how we relate to the world, how we interact with each other. We're constantly moving. And if we pay attention, again, using this quadrant to where and how I'm moving in respect to the points being made or the idea being presented, then I'm also going to increase my understanding of where the value is, where the energy is going to. Now, the last quadrant is the voice. So that your pitch, tone, cadence, all that also grouped together, you're going to see when that person goes up an octave, when they're flat, they don't care, when they go down and they seem to be disappointed. All those things are important. If you link all those things together, and let's say you go back two weeks after this or a month, and and you employ something that uh, Dell and I call targeted validation. And let's say you want, you know, you want to improve your standing with this person. You, you're trying to make an impact and say, I'm a leader. I want to be seen as such. I want to develop more. So you've identified something in this, in this person that has some aspect of control over your future. And you say to them a month later, hey, listen, boss, I just want you to know that when you were talking uh, to us uh, about client engagement, you know, I really heard you say, about the need for for checking in and how important that is. And I just want you to know that I, I'm sure you've realized that I have increased my frequency with that. And also with the people that report to me, I've, I've asked them to increase their frequency too, because it, it helps in accountability. And it's really made a difference in my team. Hmm. Now, can you imagine that uh, you and I, Adele and I always talk about this, is that how often in our worlds do people come up to us a month later and say, hey, you know that thing that you said at that meeting? It really made an impact on me. And I just want you to know that that because of that, I've done this, that, and the other thing. And I want to thank you. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's the kind of thing it, that's just one aspect of what forensic listening can do. But it, it shows I'm paying attention. I value what you're saying. 
Not only that, I'm understanding you in a way perhaps that no one else has taken the time to do that. So that's a long well, way to go around of what forensic listening is. Well, I mean, I'm taking furious notes, so I'm, I'm a, I, I, I think it's fascinating. And it's also, I like frameworks. That's another thing. But, yeah. but um, <laughs> me too. Yeah. So, so when, you, when you're in a meeting or like, and whether it's a crisis or uh, really, I guess you, can, you should be using a model like this anytime you're in a, a anytime you're in anything critical, especially. Um, are you marking all of your observations against time uh, and and trying to, you know, match it up in some way? Um, and is is there is there like a, I don't know, a, a certain way that you should be uh, looking at, observing in the right? What mindset do you need to be in, et cetera? But like, how, how can how can this move into implementation? So one of the things we recommend is, you know, like there's some great AI tools mm-hmm. like um, Otter AI. It's a great tool, right? Where at the end, sometimes it will come up with a summary of like, these are the main tones. These are the, this is where, this is the takeaways. I mean, Otter AI does a lot of this for you, but if you just use that and take notes on a sheet and just add some like quotes or, you know, understand where their emotion goes up or when they get deflated, that's important too, right? Like, What are they not buying into? Um, What themes do they consistently repeat? As Chip was saying, like, what stories do they keep going back to? A lot of times we miss it. People are telling us exactly who they are and what they want. We just don't want to hear it, right? We're like, well, we came to get this goal in mind. And and the other person's just, they don't want to buy into it the way we do. And so being flexible and understanding, like, you're listening, you're present, um, and but you are taking very good notes about the emotions. Chip has this great story, Dan. I've, I've got, he's got to tell it about, um, uh, Vickers, mm-hmm. um, and go, going out and like, what, this is kind of how we came up with the framework for forensic listening. Oh. Um, when Chip told me the story, it was like, it was, I was like, forget it. I'm like, that's so, that's so interesting. Well, I'd love to hear it, but that build up. Oh yeah. <laughs> so this is in our book, uh, convince me. And, and it's, it's a tell about myself when I, Drop the ball big, right? (laughs) So it goes like this. As a new agent at the Washington field office, I was assigned to the Fugitive Apprehension Group. And it was one of those things where every law enforcement entity was present. I mean, if you had a badge, you were going to be there, right? Everybody was involved. Um, And I got, I, I had the great fortune of being paired with U.S. Marshal Justin Vickers. And this guy, Dan, was par excellence fugitive hunter. Mm-hmm. He was so smart um, and so skilled in the, in the craft. I just was, you know, so excited to be paired with him. You know, it's not often that I get that, you know, you get an opportunity to have a contact with somebody who is like at that level at, at such a young agent. So I'm super nervous, right? I, I'm fresh out of Quantico. I'm paired with this guy. We're hunting fugitives. And, you know, there's a whole team out there. One day after we made a, an arrest, the whole team, um, after that, the, the kind of pattern that you did was that you started following the leads of some other people that were on your list, other people that um, were needed to be arrested, right? Fugitives. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Or in the wind, as we say. So, so, um, so this one particular time that we had a lead on a, on a guy, you know, violent fugitive, gang related, um, always weapons involved. And he said, you know what? He goes, he's got a grandmother close to here. Why don't we swing by? I said, great. Absolutely. So as we're approaching, he pulls up, we park on the curb. Justin turns to me, he says, Chip, I'll tell you what, I'm going to have you take the lead on this. I want you to interview her see what we can get and see if we can get any kind of good lead value from this. I said, fantastic. Okay. He goes, so you know what, you know, you, you know, the questions asked, you're Quantico trained, you're ready to go. And he said, just, you know, just do your thing. And he's just so calm, right? So easy going. So as we are approaching the, the, the door, climbing the steps and he just, and he taps me on the shoulder one time. He goes, listen, Chip, before you knock, I don't want you to knock like, you know, you FBI guys typically do, you know, boom, 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 FBI open up because I don't want any of that nonsense. He said, 
I just want you to gently knock. Okay. Don't, don't raise the dead here. Just gently knock. I said, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Got it. Got it. Sure. Wasn't going to do that anyway. Right? No, 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 of course not. So just, I just gently wrap that door. Immediately the door flies open. There is an older stately looking woman in front of me. I assume this is the grandmother. So I introduce myself. Hi, ma'am. My name is Agent Massey. This is United States Marshal Justin Vickers. We have some questions to ask you about your grandson. And I proceed. Now, I've got my questions right. I was writing furious notes as I was, you know, prepping in my mind. Okay, who's going to ask him? So I got it all written down on, on, you know, on my notepad. So I go up and say, so we'll we'll call the the guy Richard. So when was the last time you saw Richard? Um, have, does he have a girlfriend in the area? Does he have any part-time job? Do you know uh, any of his friends, relatives? Do you know where he does his banking? Do you know if, if he has a cell phone? Do you know when the last time he was at a family gathering? Have you heard anything about him from uh, friends, families, and relatives? That uh, I went down the list, right? Mm-hmm. And writing furiously. She's answering my questions. No, I haven't heard from him. I don't know this and that. I, I don't know. Most of it was, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So I get done my questions. I'm, you know, I'm kind of exhausted. She must have been exhausted. So I turn to Justin. And I say, hey, Justin, you got anything to add on this? He said, no, ma'am, I think that'd do it. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. And I pull out my card <laughs> and I say, here's my information. If you think of anything else, please give us a call. She thanks us, closes the door. We're walking down and I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. About myself. All right. Damn, I'm feeling very good because I got my questions out. I didn't stumble in front of Justin. I, I just wanted so badly to not embarrass the bureau and to, you know, also present myself well in front of him. And as we're walking, I said, Hey, that's that sucks. You know, dry hole, no, but he wasn't there. And while I'm talking to Justin, he's on his phone furiously texting. And I said, So, so where we go next? And and uh who you call, you know, who are you talking to? He goes, well, I'm talking to the team. I said, oh, okay, we're going somewhere. He goes, no, I'm asking them to come here. I said, well, why? He goes, he's here. I said, come again? He goes, oh, Chip. He goes, okay. He goes, we got some time before the team comes. He said, now, I, I just want to, I'm, I'm going to go back and I'm going to talk to her. He said, but before I do that, I just want you to think back in your mind about that interview you just did. He said, did you notice how she presented herself at the door? I said, yeah, she was right there, right when I knocked and answered my question. He goes, what else did you see? I had nothing. Mm -hmm. He goes, you didn't see anything, did you? Because you were asking all your dang questions. He said, you got to see what the person is in front of you as they're appearing. What are they doing? What are they not doing? He said, that woman, every time you asked her a question, she stepped a little bit further away from you, just a little. And did you notice that when she opened that door, Chip, you, how much distance was between her and the door frame? I had nothing. He goes, zero. That woman did not want to open up that door. That was an indicator for her. I want them out. I don't want them to see in. Okay? And what's the biggest tell here, Chip? What's the biggest thing that she didn't ask us? I got nothing. He goes, she didn't ask us one time about her grandson. I said, yeah. (laughs) He goes, that's a little suspicious, right? That's his grandmother. Now, if she was worried about him, wouldn't she ask? Yeah. He goes, she didn't ask because she knows because he's there. He said, now I'm going to go back. Just, you know, you take my position. I'll take yours. And I just want you to watch. Okay. Just take it in. So I'm like, I don't know. So he not just again, he's not even hitting the door. Door flies open. There's the woman. And I see it. She's got that door tight against her side. There's zero daylight there. Body positioning, Mm -hmm. right? This is it. Yep. And he says, ma'am, I'm sorry to bother you again. His voice gets ultra low. He said, here's the thing. I want you to just nod your head yes or no to my questions. Your grandson, he's here, right? She goes, yes. She's nodding her head. 
Okay. And he points up. He goes, upstairs? Shakes her head, no. Mid-level? No. Basement? Yeah. Shakes her head, yes. So, okay. The team's pulling up in back of us, right? So, okay, ma'am. I need to ask you another question. Does he have a gun? She goes, she goes yes. Okay. I just want you to step aside, ma'am. We're going to come in, okay? We're going to make sure everybody's safe. So we go in. We do the, sure enough, there's the guy. Rest him, pull him out. But it was, you, you know, that's what I was so focused in on my notes, what I was getting out into, you know, the questions I was asking her and her response, but not seeing the total picture. And that's, that was the critical piece that I was, I was missing in that whole, whole situation. So, so that, that was a, that tipped you towards this whole idea of forensic listening, or that, that was your first experience not doing it and understanding that you need to kind of, you know, understand more in it, the idea of, of just going back and reviewing what you said and the reactions that you see is valuable enough. I mean, clearly you're in a very dangerous situation. It's very different than like, Hey, I was just in a meeting with, you know, the marketing team. And, uh, did you notice what the uh, brand leader said on blah, blah, It's a little different, but, <laughs> but still the principles are the same, right? So, so when you're doing, uh, doing all the work and you are, um, you know, you, you would hope that there is a, that there is a, uh, Marshall Vickers in the room with you that, you know, can, can sort of observe and guide and, you know, mentor and do all the right things. Um, but for, for those of us who are out there, um, you know, just dealing with whatever situation has dealt us, you know, crisis or not, um, taking this framework into the, into the room and just understanding. And then, and I love the idea of using AI tools. It's, you know, you kind of, kind of threw me that softball because it's something that I wanted to ask you about anyway. Um, you know, I'm partial to a couple of the, uh, transcripting tools myself. And I often go back into the, into transcripts and ask, okay, ask the AI, well, okay, what, what are the themes here? What's happening here? Cause it, it allows me to be present in the meeting without actually having to worry to scrabble. Right. But Great. regardless, right. So then you have all this information, you know, if you've done your, you've done your work, you're, you're looking at emotions, you're, you're, you're hearing the underlying themes. And, and when you say theme development, just to go back to that quadrant, when you say theme development, you, you, you're looking at what's unsaid and what's said at the same time, right? You're trying to figure these things out, right? That's a whole yes. skill in and of itself, by the way. It's just, just trying to figure out what's being unsaid. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so you have all this stuff. So let, let me ask Adele, um, when, you, when you have, when you take this approach in a, in a meeting or with a client or, you know, in general, you know, what's, what is the action you take? What's the next step? You, you mentioned earlier targeted validation. So, so how do we flow into this and how do we then kind of, you know, make it part of our crisis process? Right. So, you know, targeted validation is this idea and, and validation in general is something so many of us, especially communicators, sort of miss, right? Because I think it's the type of environment we were all um, I, uh, came up in, I think, in corporate communications, I, again, I don't know if this is everybody's experience, but it was certainly mine. I never got validated for anything. <laughs> um, I mean, I cut my teeth on Madison Avenue in New York. Yeah. So like nobody in New York ever validated anything I did ever. Yeah. Um, you know, if I got like a, you know, hey, good job. It was like the end of a multi-million dollar campaign oh. after you oh, for sure. had a, you know, 48 hour. Hey, there's, a gen event. there's generally a generational thing there too. Like the, the, uh, the youngins, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, need a lot of, a lot of validation. Um, and, uh, we as managers spend a lot of our time kind of understanding that, um, you know, hearing that as part of the subtext of what they're saying. Um, but anyway, sorry to interrupt it. I think you're right. No, I think no, you're no. totally right. That's I, the way we came up, you know, like nobody's going right? to, you know, it's okay. What have you done for me lately is the kind of validation. Right. Right. And I think that's a lot of corporate communications. It's like prove your value every single day. You would kind of mention that in the beginning of the show. And I think that's really true. Um, and if you can find a way to take those notes and take those interactions that you have with people and validate the thing they care about the most, the thing that they have the most energy around, the thing that they, that would convince them that you are invested in their best possible future, you are going to be someone they trust. You're going to be someone they bring into meetings. You're going to be someone they remember because 
like Chip said, how many times on one hand could you um, could you remember somebody going, three weeks ago you said this in a meeting, it really impacted me. It just almost never happens in our career, right? Yeah. So don't we, uh, we say that anecdote and people go, oh, I swear, if you just do that, if you just did that one thing, if you did forensic listening and, and left this podcast, never did another thing, you would be a hundred times more effective than you are right now when you are not doing it, right? Just coming up and saying to somebody, wow, you really impacted me. Tremendous. I can remember all the people who said it to me. Yeah. I, I, I remember, and it's a, it's, a, it's a small group. So it's like, you know, I mean, just that's super powerful. But then, you know, we have other tools and tricks. And um, I have to say, some of this stuff sounds a little manipulative. Um, and so some people will say, oh, well, well, you're manipulating people. And it's like, okay, as communicators, as persuaders, as influencers, as negotiators, and that's really what we are doing. It, corporate communications is so many different skills um, in one. It really is a lot of different things. And what we are doing, you, if you have a hammer, you could build a house or you could break a window. It just depends on how you use the skills. So um, as we were writing the book, Chip and I were asking each other questions and we were writing the book over COVID because after we had that like really um, gangbusters, great masterclasses, we were like, okay, we've got something here. It's COVID. Business is slow. Let's write a book. So that's what we did, right? We got a, we got a publisher and, and we did it. So great use of time. And, and that's what we did. But I, I, I was asking Chip, I was like, who are, and, and I came up with a weird answer. I was like, who are some of the most convincing people in the world? Right. And, and, and he's like, I don't know. I was like, fortune tellers. Oh. I was like, fortune tellers are incredibly convincing. I was like, you give them 50 bucks. And in a half an hour, they literally will tell you that they understand you on a magical, mystical level. And they're predicting your future. And you're like, here's another 50 bucks. Yeah. So you can tell me what happens next year. I mean, like, it's crazy, right? We're so easily taken in by these folks. How, how do they do it? How do they do it? But I have a Jersey related story mm -hmm. um, that is fun. So I went to Middletown North High School um, and um, my teacher was a creative writing teacher. And she just happened to know Madame Marie, who is the subject of Bruce Springsteen's song. Oh, goodness. Right? Okay, of course, there's always, there's always a post connection. But anyway, so she invites this fortune teller into our class. And the fortune teller is like reading the room. And it was like this is creative exercise, right? She's reading the room and she zones in on me, this like Adele Gambardella, this like little chunky Italian girl, right? And she zeroes in on me and she says, You, um, I think your father, a, a male figure, with a, with a name starting with a J, an M, but I'm seeing J, um, I'm seeing, I'm seeing pain around the heart. I'm seeing something. I, I don't know. I just have a, I, you know, I have this bad feeling, but I'm seeing this pain. Does that, does that, ident do you identify with that? It's like, okay, this is not a, this is not a far stretch. Um, I'm Italian. My mom makes really fattening <laughs> fried meatballs. <laughs> My dad's name is Jack. <laughs> Like, it's like, these are not hard. Like, you know, Jed, John, Joe, and they're like, you know, how many people, what is everybody's name yeah. in, in Jersey, right? It's like, it's, this is not a far fetch. So basically what she was doing was she was just asking me questions. She was asking me good point questions and pulling information out. But what she wasn't doing was it wasn't actually questions. And that's what I was talking to you about. I was like, it wasn't questions. It was statements. Uh -huh. She was making these predictive statements about me. And all I was doing was filling in the blanks. I kept filling in the blanks. I kept giving her more information. She was guessing about some things. Some things are easily guessed that we all could guess about people, right? Yeah. And so using that and understanding that as the framework, um, I thought she was super convincing. And I walked away feeling like she knew something about my future. Now, <laughs> she didn't. Yeah. And um, like, obviously, right? But she used something called the four-year effect. And what we call predictive statements. Now, here's here's what we mean by that. And here's how you could use them in business. Now, we're not saying you guys should go be fortune tellers. Yeah. <laughs> no. But what you need to do when you are trying to convince someone of something is you could use this method. This methodology is incredibly effective. Something like this, Dan. You have an enormous amount of untapped potential. And I just see that you don't utilize it for these reasons. And I stop. Now, what I did was I made a statement. 
I said something positive about you, but I also said some sort of negative and I stopped. What are you going to do when I say that about you? You're either going to make an excuse or fill in the rest of the thing, or you're going to say, hmm, I can see that, <laughs> you know, uh, or, or you might ask, well, why do you feel that way? Um, what, one of those three, I think, will kind of result. Either way, all of those things open up more conversation and you start to begin to tell me about what your untapped potential is. Mm. And then I get a really good sense of what's super important to you. Within like one statement, I get a sense of what you think other people don't know about your potential. You know, there, there is that whole, uh, uh, I know it's called, you. I'm sure that you do, maybe this is the foyer effect, um, where you leave an open question, you just wait patiently until the first person speaks. I mean, you know, you would hope that the other person isn't trained in the waiting game because uh, it could turn into that's, you know, could turn into that in negotiation for sure. But so oftentimes, you know, when you're in a certainly in a stressful situation, um, uh, an employee re a review situation, but in a crisis, you know, this is the kind of thing that you'd want to do to really get the real story from the crisis actors or from the people who are suffering from the, or whoever you're representing. Let's face it that way. Right. So. Um, how have, have you found that to be really effective uh, in, in your in your crisis work and in, in your negotiationship and, and Adele, both the open question? It, it does work. And I, I would like, Chip, could you jump in about how you used predictive statements? Mm -hmm. And I know it wasn't exactly like the four-year, but on interrogations or interviews, because you did sort of do these kinds of things with folks, right? I mean, you did use some of these techniques. Yeah. So, you know, part of the, the skill set is given for hostage negotiation is also given for interviewing, right, purposes. So um, you're sitting across from somebody, you've got a suspect, uh, any, any, just think of a violation. And so you're asking them to tell the story. And you're going to, at some point, you're going to say, just like any good interviewer, you're going to say, hmm, I said, um, I, I wonder why you know, you did that particular thing. Can you, you, ju you just told me that you said X or that you did Y. Can you unpack that for me? What else happened? And you let that hang. And then you can say to this person, say, you know, if, if like, say, you know where this is going, you know, in general, this is the person. Um, and you know, they're holding back on you. So, you will take a, a beat and you'll say something like, listen, I just want you to know, I, I've obviously interviewed thousands of people, talked to a lot of, of criminals, and I just want you to know that you're not a bad guy. And I let that hang. So what's that do? Well, he's got to now come up with something which affirms what I just said because it's a positive attribute to him. So he would say something, right, exactly. I'm, I'm not a bad guy. This is not, this is, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not involved in stuff like this. Well, any, just like you guys were saying as, as interviewers, all information is good information. I don't care what you say, as long as you're talking, as long as you're talking, I know there's a good chance I'm going to get some information and information is what I need. Cost is negotiation. My job was to shut up. My job was to elicit, begin the conversation, get that person talking and shut the hell up because they're going to say something that's going to be important that I'll be able to attach to, that I'll connect an emotion, an experience, a theme. There'll be something there and I'll return to it. And I'll use that as a means of breaking through into the world that they're in right now. Just like with just like with interviewing, so yeah, in, yeah, that that could describe almost any any conver any hard conversation with any leader uh, who's a little recalcitrant, you know, doesn't want to talk about things. Um, I wanted to ask you that because this is something that I that we all experience in our worlds for different ways, Chip certainly, and in, in extreme ways. Uh, but you know, you talked about emotion as one of the 
you know, one of the governing factors of forensic listening, but also, you know, clearly we all are governed by emotion in crisis response mode uh, and being able to step out of that and be cool and collected and rational and reasonable and everything is a, is a, is a, a skill or, or it's, a, it's a difficult step to make. But what I wanted to ask you was, when you're dealing with somebody where fear is the motivator, whether it's a criminal or, you know, a, a CFO who has just learned that, uh, you know, the stock reports were fudged or w- whatever the case may be, a, a, a president who's, uh, who's, whose policy just went over like a lead balloon, something like this, right? There fear, there's a fear <laughs> motivator there. Um, I would imagine breaking through fear is harder than other things. How do you so how do you deal with that? Because you know, in a crisis, et cetera, this is something that I think everybody needs to be extremely mindful of. And what is what's a good approach when you know fear is the motivator? A chip, one chip, that's you. That's okay. okay. that's you. Come on, that's totally all you. Yeah. <laughs> so when you're dealing with with people in fear, what is it that we value when we're afraid? Safety. Well, we we value things like comfort, certainty. Um, experience and another individual that's been through it, somebody that is trusted, somebody that can, can say to us, Hey, listen, we've all been there. We've done this. Um, and, and that's really what, what the, the crisis work that when I see Adele work in, in this area is that, you know, one of the things that we always say to clients is that, listen, you're making a lot of these decisions for the first time. We've made these decisions hundreds of times. And we have a tested way of doing it. Right now, that person is thinking, oh my gosh, there's a million things that could go wrong. And there are, right? And it depends on the timing of what you say, how you say it. When is something introduced? When do you put that message out? When do you pull it back? Who is it that you need to involve at this juncture in the crisis? Who is it that you don't need to listen to, right? And who and, and do we have an idea of the stake? I mean, it all it goes on and on. But that's the idea here: is that when we are afraid, we want people that have that mindset of, of hey, I'm here with you. I'm collaborating with you. This is something we are doing together. That appeals again to those to those emotions in us that say, ah, yes, okay, my reptilian brain gets it. You're going to offer me help. And that and that brings us closer together as a result of that. Yeah. Yeah. And Dan, the other thing too is like crisis management is a muscle. It's really a muscle, right? And it's one of those things that like, I love it because I – think really fast and on my feet. I and I and and that's probably got to do something with my ADHD, but whatever, <laughs> right? Like like whatever if it's 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 it's, it's hyper focus, right? So when I'm in really tough situations, I can usually hyper focus and think five steps ahead when everybody else is still just where they are, right? It's a muscle though. And so we we have this we have crisis training so good it's criminal, yeah. right? It's it's a workshop that we do. And we do it for communicators, we do it for VR people, we do it for people who are in leadership positions. And essentially, Chip takes them through a hostage negotiation role play where people sit around um, and actually we have an actor who's a friend of mine from college. He's Emmy award-winning actor, Hollywood, like, you know, screenwriter, cool guy, right? And he's the actor on the other line. And he's responding to how, whether or not they're actually using our skill set. And everybody walks away and is like, oh my God, that was transformative. I've never handled a high stress situation like that before. It was, it was so exciting. I didn't realize how I was under pressure and, and what I learned. And Chip becomes like this like crazy on-scene commander. And then also the nice Chip mm-hmm. that's teaching you the skill set. And then the crazy on-scene. And we go back and forth, right? And we do this in our workshop and people are transformed um, because you have got to keep doing this. This is not one of those skills where you could just insert yourself in a situation that's super difficult or even something that's minorly difficult and do well if you don't know exactly how to handle it, right? And and that's the benefit that we have when we come in with our clients and they're just like, just take it away. And it's like, okay, we got this. 
We know how this is going to come out. And a lot of times you're talking people through counterintuitive measures. Like we're trying to get them to do the opposite of what their instinct yes. says, right? And the opposite of what their instinct says. Like they want to withhold. It's like, this is the time to not withhold. They want to not apologize. I'm not, you know, filling the explicative apologizing. Um, they should apologize, right? Like, you know, they don't want to put out information because legal is telling them not to. This is where public relations has a really, corporate communicators have a really interesting um, role. And Chip and I have, have, have had this experience on many, many mm -hmm. crises where legal is saying one thing and it is the wrong thing to do. We had oh. one situation where, you know, um, you know, we had a crisis and they kept responding with letters. Mm. One letter, one legal letter after the next, and one, and one, and one. And it was like, all it was doing was just escalating people. And then they called us up and they were like, we need your help to write a letter. We're like, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> and it needs to go through an attorney. We're like, no, that's just, we're not writing another letter. Like, this is not the right approach. And so like, you know, and we get on the phone with this, you know, crotchety old attorney and he was pretty like argumentative and he's like, Mm -hmm. Um, wait, Chip, maybe you could tell the rest of the story so I could be nice. <laughs> Crotch the old attorney, eh? <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you. <laughs> no, that was, was it, that? right? Um, it was, it was one of those things and he was doing all the wrong things. Like, it was amazing. He was, when we're in this meeting, he was saying, you know, what we just got to do is hold these people's feet to the fire. We've got to threaten lawsuits. Ooh. We've got to, we've got to tell them that they're wrong and why they're wrong. And Adele and I were going, no, like none of that ever. Because that's always when Again. people respond the best and when you tell them they're terrible. Yeah, yeah it's always good. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it, it we was love like, that. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's kind of also reading what we call the unstated narrative, mm -hmm. and the the unstated narrative is is it's the tapes. We all have thousands of tapes running in our head, right, at any one given time about our world, what's in our world, who's in it. Who do we interact with on a daily basis? What do we think about that person? What they represent? What they mean to us? How we really feel? And then there's also that, what is it that we're going to say in front of them about them? Mm -hmm. There's a disconnect there, right? I mean, we can't always go around in the world and say exactly what we mean to the people that we're interacting with. That's a problem. So we have to pull some of that back. If you want to understand why somebody might be reticent to sign on on the dotted line or uh, agree with the path, You, if you can get to that unstated narrative, whatever that holdback is, by, again, what, you know, advising through what we do, forensic listening, asking those good questions that are going to elicit robust responses, in there, there's going to be nuggets. You're going to get an idea. You know, I, I just need somebody that, you know, they, they may not have said it. I, I need a, you know, I need a vendor that I can count on somebody that I know that no matter what, it's going to be there at a specific time and in the amount I need yeah. period. And, and they might be thinking, you know, I just, I just don't think you're that person. So you hear a little bit about, you know, it's really important for us to get deliveries on time and we're all about price. So, you know, I, it's price is so important and we really like things to, to be there mm -hmm. in the warehouse when we have, right. So they're returning to that theme yeah. again, that's their unstated narrative. Now, if you can get close to that, you have a huge advantage as a result of mm -hmm. that. Yeah. It, so it's, it seems like, like we should know that. Right. Uh, but, but clearly I think in, in, in the hustle, and I'll go back to what we said before, in the hustle to just get to that result that we know, you know, either we want to be people pleasers and say, you know, okay, we're going to get you out of this crisis, or we're going to get you to get you that to that result, and hey, oh, finally, you're paying attention to the PR people. Okay, we're going to do what we can, and and uh, <laughs> you know, I'm going to show you how valuable I am. You know, um, there, there's a lot of dynamics happening there on a you know on a psychological level, and certainly on a neuroscientific level. And I've had some, I've had a neuroscientist or two on, and then it's yes. fascinating to think about that. But we're going to have to put a pin in that one. Think about, you know, kind of get back to that another time, because I see that we, we have been talking for almost an hour and I am just, I've, it's been going like so fast for me, but there was, there was one, there was one question, I, although I did want to ask you both, because, you know, this is the trending communicator. You're both trending communicators. Um, you know, 
what do you think the future of crisis is? The future of crisis comms is. I mean, what should what should our listeners be paying attention to now? What should they be learning in your mind? Yeah. And I'll, we'll start with Adela. Sure. So I think one of the things that's really interesting is you're going to see a lot of companies. You're going to see a lot of individuals who are hard pressed to give their opinions or positioning on controversial matters as they come up, especially with the U.S. election, uh, right, which is probably going to be incredibly contentious. You're going to see companies have to take a stand, have to take a position. And what communicators need to do right now is to get to the core issues, get to those core issues super fast and predict what they're going to be, understand what their boundaries are for the company and make sure you stick within them. And there, we, we actually offer a program where we take boards and communication teams and marketing teams through exercises to figure out what are their core issues and what is not a core issue. Yeah. And they should be doing that right now. They should be doing that like in the next three to six months before the election happens. Mm -hmm. Because the last thing you want to do is have someone reach out and be like, what is your stance on this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you're seeing it with universities. You're seeing it with companies. Yeah. You're seeing, you know, you're seeing it now. It's starting to prop up, but it is just the beginning. Yeah. And I think if you are not, if you are a communicator and you are not thinking about this, you should be and get a program going, mm -hmm. get, get your boundaries set yeah. and make them clear. Yeah. That's, that's good advice. And before I get to you, Chip, um, I just, I, the one, one thing about that, that we talked to before, actually, we even started our conversation today, um, is that, you know, in, in, in your previous work, um, Adele, you, you'd mentioned that, you know, the, uh, uh, people don't want to hear from brands as much as brands think that people want to hear from them. Right. It, it's it's, you know, it's very rare, actually, for a brand to have something interesting enough to say for uh, the public to, to be concerned or for anybody really to be concerned, except, you know, when it comes to business in this world now where uh, there's so many. It's a minefield. Right. We're seeing more and more businesses pull back from making these kinds of public statements. Um, like, I don't think that I would advise my company to have serious position about very, some very serious issues. I'd want to focus in on the ones that are important. To, like the only things that are totally 100% aligned with our purpose and mission, right? And anything, anything, out, anything outside of that zone, you know, sorry, you know, there's, there's nothing really for us to say. Um, and, you know, we're, but, but my company, you know, is fortunate in that we're not making bombs and we're not, you know, uh, a financial we're not, we're not moving financial markets. You know, we, we make kitchen and bath appliances. So there's a very, very different kind of approach. But for a lot of companies uh, who are in the spotlight and who certainly are at the cutting edge of technology and like are always like looking for, they're going to need to say things and they're going to need to have, have a position for sure. Um, I, I, I don't know if, if you agree with that, but that's, uh, yeah. I do. Yeah. I do. And what I would say is the interesting thing about your company too, and I know that you know this and good communicators know what those issues are. Here's the thing. If an issue does come mm -hmm. up and you are relevant, yeah. it is truly your duty <laughs> to respond. If there is something that's like right in the middle of your core issue mm -hmm. and you don't respond, it's malpractice. Great. Right. Malpractice. It's malpractice. Yeah. It's malpractice. Yeah, yes. no, I, so. I hear you on that one. Did you say duty on purpose? I just want to know. <laughs> That's, I know. I'm, I'm so stop. used to, I'm so stop. used to the, to the, uh, to, the <laughs> to the, to that. Um, we do, we do it all term, all time internally. Um, so Chip, what do you think? What do you think people should be looking out for? What, what is the future of crisis? Like what should people be doing? Yeah. Like? You know, I, the, this kind of reminds me it, uh, kind of like the crux of what we're about um, is that, Things are so heightened, you know, it, it's, it's almost expected. Mm -hmm. We, every, you know, every waking moment we're confronted with something that is polarizing, something that, that creates a sense of distrust in the other person. And what we try to do in, in our, in our convincing um, workshops is to present scenario planning. And so it's like, 
whatever it is that you're going to to be dealing with, we can we can talk about that here. Let's put it on the table and we'll devise some some possible scenarios. We'll have role players. You know, there's an interaction effect there. But the whole idea with that is why is training so valuable in these kind of times? Well, it's important because one, if you're not in control of your own emotions, how you react to these issues, then you're lost and you're now a part of the problem. And if you can learn to not only be in control of these emotions, but to also harness your better angels, get in there with a degree of, hey, I am future focused. I am, I want us all to do well and I want well being for everybody. It's one of the things we say. It's like, as a, like, for example, Dan, as a hostage negotiator, I never negotiated with anybody. It's kind of a misnomer yeah. in the title. I was actually convincing that person. I was convincing that person to value what I valued slowly, methodically, you know, going down a continuum. But I wanted him to value life. I wanted him to value, you know, surrendering to me and I'll make his day safe to release those hostages, to, to put out some good news about that he's not such a bad guy. That takes time, right? And it takes control. It takes discipline. And that's what I, some of the things that I feel is lacking in the, in the world and the narrative right now is that nobody's displaying that kind of discipline. So, so if I'm disciplined, I am convincing that person. I'm not going to go back and forth with them about you want $2 million and a plane mm-hmm. and a jet. Okay. Right. It's on the way. I'm never going to be talking about getting him a plane and $2 million, but I will talk about, Hey, just curious, what would you do with that $2 million? Right. I am going to talk about where would you go in that plane? Mm-hmm. It should be more like 10. Don't you think Chip? 10 yeah, it absolutely should be 10. It <laughs> absolutely should be 10. <laughs> No like You're not getting it. So, <laughs> so, but, but what, so, cause it was, it was never going to be a back and forth like that. Never going to be, okay, you got seven people in there. Tell you what you kill three, give me back four. We'll call it a no. day. That's never going to happen. So convincing is kind of like a higher level thing. When you think about that, yeah, you think about all the, the, the major treaties that, the, and, and the accords that have been hammered out by political leaders. Mm. It wasn't, you give me this, I'll give you that. What happens at Camp David? Camp David is not about, all right, let's let's get down to brass tacks here on, you know, how we're going to how many people we're going to put into this effort and, you know, what we're willing to do. When when leaders get together, they talk about future and they talk about the kind of future that they want their grandkids to have. And that brings it home to them. That's convincing. Yeah. Those are the kind of conversations that are higher level convincing. Negotiation is kind of like lower level tertiary stuff. That's things that other people work out after you've done the big picture item. So I, I, that's, that's yeah. kind of my thinking right so, now. So what is the world you want? What is, the, what is, what is your yeah. motivation? What, what, are you, what are you really after? What would be that outcome, not for us, but for those that come after us? Um, I, you know, these are very high concept ideas. And I, I, I love it. I think I need to dig in a little bit more. I definitely am going to read the book convince me available everywhere, by the way, uh, on Amazon and certainly, um, at, um, convincingcompany.com, which is where you can find, uh, Adele and chip and all the services and, and everything that they offer uh, check out their bios, everything there. Um, I did want to get into AI with you guys so badly, but you know what? It's okay. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it's really funny. Cause I, cause that's, it's something that I talk about here a lot. And, um, you know, it's of concern to all communicators. I read this article before, uh, before getting on the, on our, on our show today about, um, how, you know, a particular PR professional is using AI to do crisis scenarios. And it's really, you know, it's very helpful in that way. Well, again, something that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about another time or, 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 you know, kind of put on hold for now. But I, I do think that you have so many things to say about that, about, um, about just in general, uh, how to better understand what you're contending with uh, and, um, and then what your coping mechanisms should be so that you can then turn that to your advantage or to, to the outcome that you want or that you need. And convince is the right term, I feel, I feel like. I always talk about persuade, but I think convince is probably better. Yeah, you probably agree. we thought so too. I probably agree, that's why your company 
It's called Convincing Company. <laughs> Again, everybody, uh, convincingcompany.com. Um, on all the socials, it's Convincing Company. Uh, look for Adele Gambardella at, um, on LinkedIn everywhere. Uh, look for Chip Massey on LinkedIn. Um, are you guys on any of the other, so- other socials? Are you active anyplace else? We are. We have an Instagram account, oh. convincing co underscore. Convincing so co. check that out. Right. Underscore. Uh-huh. Yes. Thank you. I had to abbreviate a little uh-huh. bit. Um, but yeah. And uh, so LinkedIn, Facebook as well. Uh, but yeah, Instagram, we're doing a lot of, a lot of videos, a lot of, um, a lot of short form content. Oh, so it's great. Yeah. yeah. And our listeners can't see uh, Chip and Adele here, but I guarantee you that you'll enjoy the videos. They're just the way that you guys inter- interact with one another and interplay with one another is, is just a joy to watch and joy to see. And I will thank you for putting me at ease uh, in interviewing two people at once or having a conversation with two people. It's not really. Um, and any last last words, you guys, before we before we split? Just this one thing that I, I learned um, as a result of writing the book, which surprised me, mm-hmm. which is the idea that um, you never start with your strongest point first. Mm. Never start with the strongest point for it first, because if you do that, all you do is make everybody in the room dig their heels in. I guarantee there's not one communicator who is on this call who ever walked in and gave their greatest idea. And then 10 seconds later, everybody's like, that's it. That's it. That's the idea. We love it. We're leaving now. Everything's done. You're genius. Thank you. I mean, in our wildest dreams, when we get off, when we get out of the meeting and we talk to our best friend or our mom, that's how that meeting went, but never it, it's never how it happened, right? So instead, you have to take people through a continuum. You have to convince them in the right way, and we we um, we um, depict a lot of that in the book. Mm-hmm. Talk about how to do that. Uh, what's what's the measure to do that really effectively? And um, so, really good good stuff. Terrific. And and Chip, anything for our audiences? Any more? Um, I I th- I think I said I I just uh, you know talking about the idea of you know deep listening. Mm. You know, so much our own stress improves when we're really listening and trying to help somebody else and we can come up with better solutions. We're so much more creative in our own brain space when that happens. So excellent. I can think of no better last words. Deep listening. Convince me. Everybody convince me the book. Go get it. Um, Thank you, Chip and Adele, for joining me today. And, um, you know, hope to have you back again to dig into some further topics on The Trending Communicator. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time to listen in on today's conversation. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to subscribe through the podcast player of your choice, share with your friends and colleagues, and leave me a review. Five stars would be preferred, but it's up to you. Do you have ideas for future guests or you want to be on the show? Let me know at dan at trendingcommunicator.com. Thanks again for listening to The Trending Communicator.